Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for session one of Biotelemetry for the Life Sciences. My name is Andy and I will be your host for today's event. We are very excited to kick off this series as we have had overwhelming response and feedback from the scientific community on the subject of wireless monitoring, in particular implantable telemetry in the fields of cardiovascular science and neurology. Our agenda is building and we welcome your continued input as you build on this program over the coming months, so please feel free to reach out to us. I would also like to thank our program sponsors at this time, TSC Systems, DSI, QTest Labs, and VivaQuant. And a very special thank you in advance to Brian Brockway and Dr. Robert Hamlin for their contributions in presenting this opening, opening lecture. At this point, I would like to introduce our first speaker today, Brian Brockway. Brian had a, has a master's degree in electrical engineering from the University of Minnesota. His first experience with implantable telemetry was in graduate school in the Circadian Rhythm Laboratories of Professor Franz Hallberg. Following graduation, he joined Cardiac Pacemakers, where he designed algorithms and integrated circuits for pacemakers. In 1983, he founded Data Science International. More recently, he joined VivaQuant, a startup focused on commercializing algorithms for processing clinical and preclinical ECGs in freely moving subjects. His algorithm is unique in that it removes 95% of noise while preserving morphology, resulting in faster, more thorough, and more accurate interval and arrhythmia analysis. Uh, first of all, it reduces the stress as a confounding factor in the studies. Uh, it eliminates percutaneous infections relative to uh, what you might see if you're using a tethered system. It improves the safety of laboratory personnel, reduces contact with uh, animals, and also reduces uh, potential exposure to hazardous substances that might be used. It enables longitudinal studies that are otherwise impossible, improves animal welfare, and also, Lou Kinner did a really nice paper in 1994 where he showed that uh, implantable telemetry enables design of experiments that can reduce animal use by up to 90%. So similar to most instrumentation developments of, um, uh, in that era, telemetry started with fundamental discoveries uh, followed by several groups making devices in their own research or for their collaborators. And this was followed by a commercialization phase. It appears that the first company to commercialize implantable telemetry was Konigsberg Instruments. And then commercialization fed into a validation phase and finally uh, it made it into the mainstream. On the bottom of this slide you'll see a plot of the number of publications uh, based on a uh, PubMed search of telemetry plus various types of measurements that are obtained, pressure, temperature, activity, ECG, heart rate, etc. And uh, note that there's a, a bump in publications in the time span from 1970 to 75. Uh, these publications were primarily based on some of these early homemade devices. Uh, but then you'll see that in 1990, the number of publications really shot up following the availability of a rat blood pressure implant uh, that was produced by DSI. And to confirm that these actually were DSI papers, I dug into a number of those and found that indeed uh, the vast majority were publications that used uh, DSI telemetry. So you might say that uh, the availability of the DSI rat blood pressure transmitter, uh, that was a, a device that was reliable, easy to use, and provided accurate measurements really started the process of democratization of implantable telemetry. This slide shows a timeline of events uh, in the history of telemetry that led up to the start of this rapid adoption in 1990. Uh, this timeline includes event that's, events that impacted um, implantable telemetry uh, but also has a particular focus on events that influence the direction that DSI took in implementing its devices. Uh, the timeline started in the late 40s uh, with invention of the transistor, and I know that probably sounds kind of hokey to talk about the invention of the transistor and how it impacted this, but really the transistor was fundamental enabling technology, and without that, none of this would have happened. About that same time, Norman Holter made his first wireless ECG measurements, 
And this was a picture of Dr. Holter wearing an 85-pound package that was um, fabricated in a uh, World War II Army ammunition case. This is, uh, really shows the, uh, uh, the motivation that he had to, uh, to put a device like this together. And I, I understand that his next step was to, uh, was to do some work on miniaturization. Um, so along this timeline, um, McKay published, uh, Stuart McKay published a blocking oscillator circuit in about 1957 or 1958. And this blocking oscillator circuit is a precursor of what is still used today in DSI telemetry. Um, I was unable to find an exact date for when the first telemetry monitor was implanted, but it appears to be around the time of 1960. McKay actually took that blocking oscillator circuit, turned it into a number of devices that measured implantable uh, pH, uh, temperature, um, um, electrical uh, biopotential measurements, and so forth, and uh, developed a number of different types of devices uh, using that blocking oscillator circuit. Konigsberg Instruments was founded in about 1965. They, I believe, were the first company to commercialize telemetry. And in 1968, Bill Barrows obtained a patent on a circuit for an ECG and temperature device that served as a model for the first generation DSI devices. Uh, the benefit of the approach that Bill Barrows took and also McKay with the blocking oscillator was that uh, it was extremely power efficient. Minimeter was founded in 1971. They produced devices based on this McKay design. And um, at the time, Dave Osgood was a zoology professor at Butler University, and he made temperature implants that actually provided my first introduction to uh, telemetry. DSI was founded in 1983, and the, uh, the first devices measured uh, that DSI produced measured temperature and ECG and were commercialized in 1985. And in addition to some uh, really cool low power circuitry that these devices used, uh, they provided an advance in packaging and manufacturing techniques that were uh, really critical to success of these early devices. Uh, here's a, um, a picture of what the uh, general packaging technique was that was used in these devices. It includes a hard plastic shell that was sealed with an adhesive to make the device impermeous to, to moisture. And it also, um, uh, another innovation in these devices is that we adopted some techniques that were published by engineers from Rome Air Force Base that had developed ways of improving the reliability of electronics used in fighter planes where condensation would build up on electronics during large changes in, in altitude. So these changes in these uh, very first generation DSI devices allowed uh, us to develop small devices that are relatively low cost that were reliable and also scalable in manufacturing. So the last event in this pre-1990 timeline is the release to market of an implantable blood pressure device that we developed with support from the National Institutes of Health from an SBIR program. This device used a small fluid-filled catheter that was inserted into an artery uh, and transferred pressure from the tip of the catheter to a sensor that was located inside the uh, device housing. And of course the sensor here is a really critical component and fortunately there's a Silicon Valley startup that came along in 1985 uh, called Nova Sensor that uh, had a sensor that met our exact requirements. It was a solid state micro machine sensor uh, developed from technology that came out of a laboratory at Stanford University and was very small. Uh, it was very stable, took accurate pressure measurements over a long period of time. It was inexpensive and could be operated at very low power. The tip of the catheter was 0.7 millimeters diameter, so it was small enough to allow pressure measurements in laboratory rats. So this was the first implantable blood pressure device for small animals. It was reliable, accurate, 
relatively inexpensive. And with the availability of this device, uh, the use of implantable telemetry uh, in the laboratory really took off. So I wanted to talk about some of the um, you know, key contributors to mainstream commercialization. Uh, starting in the late 50s, there was uh, availability of transistors and funding from the U.S. and Russian space programs. And, and with this funding from the space programs, there was an incredible pace of innovation in the field of implantable telemetry over a 10-year period from uh, starting in about 1957. There were dozens of publications that came out during this time period on the development of telemetry devices for physiolo physiology and ecology research. And it's really difficult to single out any person or persons that had a global impact in the field. But what I can speak to are the people that had a big impact on the development of telemetry devices at, uh, in, in the DSI product line. So the people I mentioned on this slide are those whose works we referenced in NIH grant filings that led to development of the first generation DSI devices and also were um, an inspiration to uh, the, the team at DSI. On the left uh, is a picture of Stuart McKay. He's measuring temperature of a turtle in the Galapagos Islands using uh, the blocking oscillator that he developed. Next is Wen Ko. He was from Case Western University, uh, published extensively on the miniaturization of microelectronics. In the middle is Thomas Fryer, an engineer at NASA, and he published uh, many, many works on uh, the use of uh, our various approaches to the design of implantable telemetry, all the way from materials to circuits uh, to sensors. Um, did a lot of really nice work. Um, the second from the right is James Mindel. Uh, he was a professor at Stanford University that published some of the first works in the use of integrated circuits in these devices. Uh, Bill Barrels also um, was one of the early uh, creators in this field. He was a NASA engineer um, that uh, developed a blocking oscillator circuit for developing temperature and ECG that served as a model for the early DSI devices. And then in the far right is Dave Osgood. He's founder of Minimitter and was an early inspiration for me. Uh, Dave was the first person to introduce me to telemetry when I was a graduate student and uh, also used his uh, implantable temperature sensors in Franz Hallberg's circadian rhythms laboratory. Uh, Dave was also the uh, first DSI distributor and worked with him for many, many years. I also want to give recognition to someone that isn't shown here, and that's Perry Mills. Uh, Perry was, uh, was one of the first employees at DSI. Perry is really the genius behind the electronics and transmitter circuits in the DSI devices. He has an incredible talent for designing electronics that um, are capable of obtaining very accurate measurements with seemingly uh, zero power draw. I wanted to share some of the early data that really got people excited about uh, implantable telemetry. Um, this is, uh, I want to share a story that, that um, uh, about um, a uh, early, early experience with one of these devices. Uh, after the rat blood pressure device became available, I used to travel around um, doing demonstrations at various, uh, primarily pharmaceutical companies, a few universities, and I'd carry with me surgical instruments and a telemetry receiver and a data collection system and devices and you know, try getting all that stuff through security these days. Um, I'd implant the device in a rat with several people watching and demonstrate how pressure could be measured wirelessly. Shortly after doing one of these demos at uh, Wyeth Pharmaceuticals in Princeton, New Jersey, we received an order for a system, but a few weeks later I got a call from one of the people there that said uh, that the telemetry isn't working. They had implanted it in some spontaneously hypersensitive rats, and they said that um, you know, rat blood pressures that we're seeing with your device are 30 or 40 millimeters lower than what we're used to seeing in this strain with our tail cuff system. 
But after digging into the issue, they realized that this strain of SHR rats was only hypertensive when subjected to the stress of being in a tail cuff restraint. And that's what's shown in the plot on the right. This is six SHR rats that were placed in restrainers at the asterisk. Pressure remained 30 to 40 millimeters higher than baseline uh, as long as they remained in the restrainer. Uh, so findings like this resulted in many of the research community rethinking how they were measuring blood pressure, and this generated lots and lots of excitement. So now I wanted to talk a little bit about um, some of the things that are coming uh, in the future in implantable uh, telemetry. You know, pressure, ECG, EEG, temperature, activity, uh, those are all routinely measured now with implantable telemetry. Uh, there are newly released devices that have added blood flow and glucose to that mix. Um, in the future, we're going to see adopt, uh, adaptation of new technologies such as ChemFETs, uh, and other types of sensors that will provide for measurement of a wide range of chemical entities in the blood as well as oxygen and CO2 saturation measurements. Um, but, you know, despite the fact that telemetry has really come a tremendous way in the last uh, few years, last 50 years, uh, there are, are a number of opportunities for improvement yet. Um, although large animal devices are now quite reliable, their small animal devices, particularly devices for mat, uh, mice, still have issues with um, electrical interference. I'm not aware that any devices for small animals can do multiply housed monitoring uh, or that they can provide uh, full disclosure data on multiply uh, housed animals. Moisture penetration is still an issue for many small animal devices, which affects reliability. Uh, there's also a need for smaller devices for both large and small animals to simplify the surgical implantation technique, uh, reduce infection risk, reduce surgical recovery times, and improve animal welfare. In addition, there's a need for improved signal processing and data management uh, from these devices. One of the things that implantable telemetry has done has uh, made available very large volumes of data. And now that these data are available, uh, researchers need to have tools that will allow them to leverage all of this vast volumes of data that they have in drug discovery and safety testing to uh, improve their development pipelines. So implantable telemetry has come a long way since the first device was uh, implanted in about 1960. It's now widely accepted as a tool for measuring blood pressure, temperature, activity, EEG, ECG. We're going to see a number of new devices coming on the market with new types of sensors. Um, there are a number of new suppliers that will bring more options and innovations to the market. I believe 10 years ago there were probably three suppliers and I believe now there are about seven. This increase in the number of suppliers prevents, uh, presents a great opportunity for customers. You know, as in any industry, more competition brings more innovation, it brings improved service, more options, and more favorable pricing. And I hope that scientists will embrace these new technologies and suppliers, and by doing so, they will contribute to further advances in the field of implantable telemetry. So implantable telemetry has come a long way uh, in the last 50 years, uh, but it still has a long ways to go before it reaches its potential with new devices, new sensors, new features that are be, uh, going to become available over the next uh, few years. Uh, it will become an even more powerful tool in the laboratory. So just for those that are interested, here's a list of some of the references that I used in preparing this presentation. These have large bibliographies in them if you're interested in digging into the early history of telemetry. Thank you. It was lovely hearing uh, Brian's uh, erudite presentation. We're all indebted to him for his spectacular efforts. And, <laughs> and to Andy Hudson as well for dealing with all computer ineptness than he's ever dealt with. So I'd like to talk a bit about the application of these telemetry technologies to uh, uh, physiology and pharmacology, particularly safety pharmacology.
So before we begin, we have to have a certain bit of knowledge that we must presume. Uh, what are what are we? Uh, we'd like to know parameters. To be uh, we would like to know difference in those parameters transfer to either or risk. Uh, and we would like to know how these parameters can be measured with precision, uh, the precision that's required, and with safety that's assured. Uh, we would like to know how we can interrogate these parameters without distorting them. So these are the prime desires uh, that, that, we, uh, that we have to fulfill. Okay, so now the question is, which physiological parameters are you willing to not measure? Now, before you deal with this, I'd like to point out what those are, what the, what the potential list is. So here you can see a highly schematic diagram of two pumps, the left ventricle and the right ventricle in series, uh, that are inter, uh, interposed between the lung, which oxygenates blood and removes carbon dioxide, and all of the tissues which consume the oxygen and produce the carbon dioxide. And we have the cardiovascular system, which in, consists of those, of those chambers of, that contract, and the vessels which uh, communicate to between the lung, the kidney, the mouth, and the all of the cells. Notice that the blood is, uh, uh, we add water to the blood regularly as we drink, and we remove water from the blood regularly as we urinate. So these are all of the potential structures that can be affected by drugs and by disease. Uh, we have receptors located uh, uh, in the blood vessels uh, that detect pressure and tension. We have receptors that de de detect blood volume. We have the SA node, which drives the uh, heart to contract. We have hindrance to the flow of blood imposed by the stiffness of the aorta into which the heart pumps, and the hindrance to flow through the arterioles, which protects the uh, capillaries from excessive pressure. So the properties that are potential, in which we're interested, are chronotropy, that's the ability to generate a heart rate, inotropy, the uh, ability to generate a force of contraction, which is easily measured, easily defined by the rate of cycling of heavy miramycin heads. We have lucitropy by the ease with which the chambers fill. We have energetic balance, which is a balance between how much oxygen is consumed and how much oxygen is delivered. Then we have uh, opposition or hindrance to ejection, and there are two facets. Remember, the left ventricle does not pump blood through the arterioles. They're too far away. Rather, the ventricle pumps blood into the first portion of the aorta, which then stores the energy. Then when the ventricle is relaxing, it recoils, and that's what moves blood through the arterioles. So we want to know the opposition to ejection into the first portion of the aorta, which we call impedance, and the opposition to the flow of blood through the arterioles, which we call resistance. We must know both of those. We must know venous capacitance, the ability of the veins, where 70 to 75 percent of our blood is stored. We must know the ability of it to store blood. Very importantly, we must know about baroreceptor function. That is, how do the high-pressure baroreceptors regulate the pressure, or send the information back to the brain to regulate the pressure, and the low-pressure baroreceptors located in the veins which send impulses to the brain that tells you what the blood volume is. We must know cardiac output, and not only cardiac output, but we must know where that cardiac output goes. We must know, understand the fractionation of cardiac output. Finally, we must know dromotropy, the ability of the electrical shock wave to travel through the structures from the SA node to the ventricles. And we must know uh, irritability, which tells us uh, that there, which tells us whether or not there are some structures which are uh, more, which are more irritable and dangerously so. So now, here is the list of parameters. Okay, there is no argument, absolutely no argument about the fact that drugs and disease, which affect any of these properties, translate to morbidity and mortality. Again, there's no argument. Now, the question that was asked of you is not. Do you accept that these are true, but which ones don't you care about? And Andy will look at that list uh, that you've got. Which physiological parameters are you willing to not measure? 
and, and if I could also add, although I'll not, I'll not uh, ask you about it, uh, if you're not willing to monitor it, monitor it and you know that it changes, uh, that, that, that there's a risk for morbidity and mortality, you have to think about if you're not willing to monitor it, uh, how are you going to make an explanation to the sponsor who's inquiring about it or to the patient who may be affected by it? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I, I think we've got a we, we've got a good uh, um, portion of our our audience chimed in here, and I think we've got a winner. So I'm going to close the poll. And uh, Dr. Hamlin, the winner is energetic balance. Yeah, energetic imbalance, of course, is a balance between how much oxygen is delivered to the tissues and how much is removed. Now, a drug or disease can affect uh, the body by being cytotoxic, uh, poisons the cells. However, uh, and that occurs acutely. Strychnine does that very, very readily. However, many drugs and many diseases have insidious onset. That is to say, they may not be cytotoxic, but they may produce an energetic imbalance. And that energetic imbalance is what ultimately causes the, de the deterioration of the function. So energetic imbalance is enormously important and uh, will make a point of, a how, of uh, how important it is. A lot of people might, will say baroreceptor function. They don't care about the high pressure baroreceptor function. Well, remember that if you look at the labels of many test articles, many drugs, sorry, test articles that have become drugs, you find that these uh, drugs are, are the caution is given, the fact that they make you lightheaded when you stand up, postural hypotension. And this stems from uh, abnormal baroreceptor function or maybe abnormal venous capacity. And so, if you don't know if a test article affects baroreceptor function or, or, or energetic imbalance, then you clearly put patients at risk for uh, morbidity and mortality. So uh, everybody knows you should measure heart rate. Everybody knows you should measure blood pressure. But the issue is that in order to predict beneficial or toxic effects, you must know about baroreceptor function and energetic uh, balance. So now. How can these be measured? Well, we know that uh, the electrocardiogram is enormously useful. We can measure the chronotropic property, that is the rate with which the heart is stimulated, not respond, but the rate with which it's stimulated, by looking at the number of P waves per 60 seconds. We measure the dromotropic property, the ability to conduct the impulse from the SA node to the furthest extent of the, of the ventricles by uh, uh, looking at intervals, the PQ interval, from the onset of the SA nodal discharge to when the ventricle first is stimulated, that's AV conduction. We want to know how fast the impulse goes through the ventricles. That's determined by the QRS duration. And we want to know the duration between the onset of stimulation and the end of repolarization. That's the QT interval. So these are intervals that can be measured easily from the electrocardiogram and are important measures to predict important properties. Then we want to know pressures. We want to know pressure in the aorta because that's important for two reasons. One, it's responsible for pumping blood through the arterioles. And secondly, it hinders the flow of blood into the aorta. So you want the aortic pressure to be just right, not too high nor too low. You want to know what the left ventricular pressure is because that gives you some insight into how forcefully the ventricle is contracted. And we want to know something about the rate of rise of interventricular pressure because that also gives you some idea about the force of contraction. But please remember, please remember that both left ventricular pressure and the PDT max are determined by the force development or the rate of force development, and that that is determined not only by contractility, but also by hindrance to injection, uh, by hi hindrance to ejection, uh, and the volume of blood in the ventricle before it contracts. So it's not enough just to measure Aortic pressure, left ventricular pressure, and DPDT max, you must know something about the filling conditions which affect these parameters. Very importantly, and I was asked, uh, I, I hesitate to say, I don't want to make anybody feel bad. I was asked by some of you to say, well, is blood flow important? We measure ECG and pressure. Why do we measure blood flow? And the answer to the question is by this question. Why do you have a heart? You don't have a heart to generate pressure. You have a heart to generate flow. Now, there must be pressure, obviously, but flow is the most important parameter. So we must know blood flow, cardiac output, and it's very nice to know stroke volume. That's how much pump per stroke. 
and we uh, we should know these uh, these parameters uh, as being supremely important. We also know what the Venus pressure is as well. Now, very importantly, we would measure many important parameters by pressure volume loops. We can't go into this now. We did this previously, and we'll do it again. But pressure volume loops allow you to measure the inotropic state. That's really myocardial contractility. It is independent of the loading conditions. So it really tells you about the velocity of cycling of heavy miromycin heads. Nobody would argue that knowledge of inotropy is important. Pressure volume loops also allow you to measure lucitropy. That's the ease of filling. Now, remember that the ventricle ventricular pressure falls quickly from systolic level to a diastolic level, but there's no filling because it hasn't yet fallen to a level below when the mitral valve opens. And so lucitropy has two properties. One is the rate of fall of ventricular pressure and the rate with which the ventricle actually fills. Very important parameters. The pressure volume loop gives you stroke volume. It gives you uh, something about stiffness of the aorta. Uh, it gives you uh, good measures of inotropy by these parameters, which we won't get into. And importantly, it allows you to predict the myocardial oxygen consumption. Remember, that oxygen consumption is one half of the energetic equation, which energetics is the relationship of oxygen delivery to oxygen consumption. So it's clear that VO2 is very important. Now, we like to image the heart. We do it by echocardiography, which is nice. Uh, magnetic resonance imaging, super nice, and uh, computer uh, uh, CAT scanning, uh, also extremely important. There are a lot of other things that we can't get into that we would like to do, and we'll maybe have some questions about that subsequently. OK, now we get to the so-called Wiggers diagram. Uh, I'm pleased to show this because this is a diagram uh, that really uh, uh, demonstrates all functions of the heart. If you understand this diagram, you understand cardiovascular physiology. I'm also pleased to mention Carl Wiggers. He was my first physiology professor and a dynamite person. Taskmaster, but extremely uh, fair. So here you can see the pressures and, 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 uh, and volumes that Wiggers showed. He showed the aortic pressure. He showed the ventricular pressure. He showed the atrial pressure. He showed the wall thickness. Uh, and he, or, sorry, the, and, uh, the volume of blood in the ventricle, and he showed the wall thickness. I added, because I believe they're important, intramyocardial tension in red and coronary blood flow in blue. Notice, please, that when the ventricle generates pressure, the tension goes up, but then even though the pressure continues to go up in the ventricle, the tension actually falls. Now, why do we care? Because it is this tension, this is called the afterload, this tension is one of the three prime determinants of oxygen consumption. Very important to know. Then let's, what, what about coronary blood flow? We'll explore these individually. Coronary blood flow, notice, is high when the ventricle is relaxing, when the pressure and the ventricle and tension are low, but falls to almost zero when the ventricle is contracting because the ventricle squeezes off its own coronary circulation. So it's obviously, it's obviously we must know the effect of drugs and disease on all of these properties in order to predict both beneficial effect and toxic, toxic effect. And notice that the ventricle does two things. Not only does it move blood, but it also sucks blood. You see, the ventricle sucks blood twice, once in systole and once in diastole. If the ventricle doesn't suck blood, it can't pump blood out. So it's extremely important that we consider these parameters as well, and we consider them because we can explore them. Now, let's address coronary blood flow. Here you see the left ventricular pressure pulse. It contracts, the pressure goes up, 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 but it doesn't yet eject, okay, because it's not exceeded the pressure in the aorta. Then the, pre then the ventricular pressure goes up, exceeds the pressure in the aorta, the ventricle ejects, then the tension in the ventricle and the pressure falls to a subatmospheric level, and notice, when the tension in the ventricle and the pressure in the ventricular wall plummets, then coronary blood flow peaks. And when the pressure goes up in the ventricle, the tension goes up, it squeezes the coronary vessels, coronary blood flow falls. So you see how important it is to understand the relationship between ventricular pressure and coronary blood flow, because it's the coronary blood flow which nourishes the heart with oxygenated blood, 
which results in the production of ATP that allows everything to take place. So we're very interested in the relationship between ventricular pressure and coronary blood flow. In order to predict potential liability and benefit of a test article, you must know this relationship. Now we can take a look at something else that's important. We mentioned the peak tension. Now in red, again, we're looking at the peak tension generated in the ventricle. There the ventricular pressure goes up. Okay, the tension goes up, but the minute the aortic valve opens, the tension actually falls, even though the pressure continues to rise. We're not so interested in this peak systolic pressure, although as we will point out later, it has meaning to us, but we're interested in the pressure at the instant the aortic valve opens, because that's when the maximal tension is generated in the wall. That's what taxes the ventricle, generating the tension, not so much moving blood, and that's what causes oxygen consumption. That's one of the prime determinants of oxygen consumption. So we're interested in the relationship between ventricular contraction and myocardial tension. And for those of you who remember uh, Laplace's law, Laplace says the tension, that is the value of this red line, is equal to the pressure times the radius, or the volume, divided by the wall thickness. So this allows you to predict what the peak tension is. And notice, please, that the peak tension does not occur when the peak pressure occurs. It doesn't even occur when the peak flow is. It occurs before there's any flow, but that pressure is enormously important because it predicts the hindrance to ejection and it predicts the uh, amount of oxygen consumed. It also predicts the likelihood that a drug or disease is going to translate to morbidity from heart failure. So now we can take a look at a, a highly schematic diagram of the uh, uh, chambers of the heart. Here is a vein returning to the left atrium, pulmonary vein. There's the left atrium, the mitral valve, the left ventricle, the aortic valve, held closed by the pressure in the aorta, sustained by the recoil of the aorta. Okay. Then we have an electrocardiogram. The P wave comes along. What's the P wave? It is a graphic representation of the electrical shock wave going through the atria that stimulates the atrial contraction right after it occurs. Look, the atrium goes from a big size to a small size, squirting, squirting some blood into the ventricle, allowing it to achieve its end diastolic volume or preload, and also squirting a little blood retrogradely into a vein, giving us the A wave of the venous pressure pulse. Very, very important parameters to analyze in the physical exam. Notice that the aortic pressure has actually fallen when the atrium is pumping blood into the ventricle because blood leaks out of the aorta through the arterioles into the veins. Then we have the QRS complex come along. What's the QRS complex? It is a voltage recorded from the body surface uh, representing, produced by, the electrical shock wave going through the ventricle. So, so no surprise, right after the QRS complex, the ventricle begins to squeeze. Look, it's squeezing closed. It has slammed closed the leaflets of the mitral valve, producing lub, the first heart cell. But there's been no blood moving. No blood moving. Not until the ventricular pressure exceeds the pressure in the aorta is the aortic valve thrown open and blood is ejected from the end diastolic volume into the aorta, leaving the ventricle at its end systolic volume. Notice that when the ventricle contracts, it goes from a big size to a, small, to a small size. Notice that the AV ring is pulled down. The atrium gets bigger. You see how much bigger that is than that? And it actually sucks blood from the vein, giving you a fallen beat of pressure and filling of the left atrium. Then, of course, the ventricle uh, begins, begins to relax and the aortic valve is slammed closed, duck the second heart sound, but the pressure is maintained in the aorta because it has stored blood from the previous injection. And so that is the force that keeps blood going through the arterioles. It is also the force that keeps the aortic valve closed. But look, the ventricle is relaxed, but it is not filling. Isovolumetric relaxation. It is not filling. Not until the ventricular pressure falls below the pressure in the left atrium will the mitral valve be sucked open, and the ventricle will suck blood from the atrium and the pulmonary veins into the ventricle. So the ventricle goes from an end systolic volume to an end diastolic volume, 
to be topped off when the atrium contracts the next time. So what we're interested in then are the pressure pulses in the atrium, in the ventricles, and in the aorta, and ventricular volume. And the super exciting thing about instrument, instrumentation is we can telemeter aortic pressure, left ventricular, sorry, atrial pressure, left ventricular pressure, and aortic pressure by miniature devices about which uh, Brian Brockway spoke and are, have really changed the complexion of our method of interrogating the cardiovascular system. What we need, what we need is something to interrogate volume. Extremely important because the ventricle cannot pump out what doesn't come back to it and we want to know what that volume is because it goes into the calculation of tension and of course the difference between the end diastolic volume and the end systolic volume is stroke volume. So we need something to give us end diastolic volume. We're lacking it. So now let's take a look quickly at the aortic pressure. We know when you go into the supermarket and take your pressure that you get two pressures. The peak systolic, 120, and the diastolic, 80. Diastolic pressure, systolic pressure. And we know that there's a mean pressure, and we know that there's a pulse pressure. But what is it that is important in interrogating a test article or disease? And the answer is, it's all of them. The peak systolic pressure describes the likelihood of you having a stroke. The diastolic pressure tells you the likelihood of you getting heart failure. The pulse pressure gives you some idea about stroke volume. And the interesting thing is that the aortic pressure goes up quickly and then kind of tapers up, goes up slowly. Well, this elevation in pressure is caused by the ventricle pumping blood into the aorta. This pressure, the dominant portion, is actually not caused by the ventricle. It's caused by a reflected wave coming from the arterial. So you see each component of this aortic pressure pulse gives you information about what the heart's doing. And if a drug or disease affects any of these properties, it would be manifested in the pressure pulse if you look at it properly uh, and gives you insight into the potential benefit or harm that's produced. We can't obviously go into this. This is a, a three-hour lecture in a regular physiology course, but uh, I think you get the point of it. So here is the uh, amplification of this. There you see the aortic pressure goes up. That's caused by blood being injected into the aorta, but then it continues to go up, not because the ventricle is ejecting much more blood, because it isn't ejecting just a little, but because there's a reflected wave. And when these components are altered, we must know about it because it translates to disease, translates to morbidity and mortality. Now, you saw schematic diagrams. I'd like to show you uh, diagrams taken by a data science device, which demonstrates the electrocardiogram, the aortic pressure in blue, the ventricular pressure in red, and in this green color, is the rate of change of ventricular pressure. You want to know where the aortic valve opens? It's right there. You know where peak DPDT max is, the maximal rate of rise of pressure? It's here. Why doesn't the pressure continue to rise as fast while the ventricle is ejecting? For that very reason, because the ventricle is ejecting, it can't generate pressure. It's dissipating force by moving blood rather than by elevating pressure. You see the rate of rise of pressure actually falls. That's, what we're so, that's why we're so interested in this. But remember, please remember that that DPDT max is determined not only by myocardial contractility, but by the volume of blood in the ventricle just before it contracts. That's known as the preload and by the hindrance to ejection. For example, how much pressure could you generate if, you, if the ventricle was contracting against nothing? The answer is you can generate no pressure. How much force can you generate with your hand pushing a feather across the room? The answer is zero. So it's important to know the aortic pressure, the left ventricular pressure, and the rate of rise of pressure, and of course, the electrocardiogram, which tells you when events could occur. OK, now we can put all of this into uh, perspective. Here you can see a ventricle uh, at its end diastolic volume. It's stimulated to contract. It contracts, and it's pushing blood into the aorta. You see that the aorta got bigger because the blood did work on the ventricle. Then when the ventricle relaxes, okay, uh, and actually fills, 
and the aortic valve closes, then the work that had been done on the aorta to distend the smooth muscle now is dissipated by constriction of the stiffness of the, of the smooth muscle, and that is what moves blood through the arterial. So we know systemic arterial pressure is important. We know it's important because it moves blood and it hinders the flow of blood from the ventricle. What is systemic arterial pressure? The product of cardiac output and hindrance to flow. Remember, cardiac output is how much blood you pump into the system. The hindrance to flow is the stiffness and the arterial or dimension. So arterial pressure can be elevated by increasing cardiac output or by making the vessels more stiff. What determines cardiac output? Simple. The stroke volume times heart rate. This tells you how much blood per beat. This tells you how many beats. Beats the product gives you cardiac output. Clearly important because if you increase stroke volume, increase cardiac output, increase blood pressure, uh, increase stiffness, increase blood pressure. You don't know what you did to cardiac output. So this allows you to look at every possibility of how disease or drug can affect. What does the drug do if it changes the amount of blood in the ventricle just before it contracts? What does a drug do if it changes blood volume? What does a drug do if it changes the rate of discharge of the SA node? What does a drug do if it constricts or relaxes the smooth muscle of the artery? This is after Bob Rushmer, who devised this diagram. We modified it a little bit. Now let's look at a particular issue. What happens if you give a drug angiotensin II, or if a physiological response is the production of angiotensin II? angiotensin stiffens up the blood vessel. So if it stiffens up the blood vessels, constricts the arterial smooth muscle, the ventricle, the aorta gets stiff, blood pressure goes up. And you know angiotensin, the name angiotensin, raises blood pressure. But angiotensin also is the thirst hormone. It makes you thirsty. So if you're thirsty, there's more water in, you increase blood volume, you increase end diastolic volume, end, end diastolic pressure, you increase end diastolic volume, and increasing end diastolic volume increases stroke volume. By what rule? The Cyan Frank Starling Law of the Heart says that the bigger the end diastolic volume, the bigger the preload, the bigger the stroke volume, the bigger the cardiac output, the higher the systemic arterial pressure. So you see, by following this, you can determine precisely what you would expect to occur in response to angiotensin II or a drug that mimics angiotensin II or the opposite with an angiotensin blocker. So let's take a look at something else. Let's take a look at a drug called adenosine. Now what does adenosine do? Adenosine slows the rate of discharge of the SA node. That will decrease heart rate, that will decrease cardiac output, and that it will decrease arterial blood pressure. But adenosine is also a relaxer of arterial smooth muscle. So if you relax the smooth muscle, the vascular resistance falls, the aorta gets less stiff, and arterial pressure falls, even though cardiac output may or may not be changed. So you see, you can predict the effect of any drug or any disease on systemic arterial pressure using this Rushmore diagram. Enormously important method of identifying the effect of drugs or disease on the total system. So now, in, conclu in, in conclusion, so we know what to measure. Unequivocally, we know what to measure. We know how to measure it precisely and safely, thanks in no small part to data science. Unfortunately, unfortunately, nobody will tell us for anything but QTC, what difference in these parameters makes a difference. Ask your clinical colleagues. Ask the regulatory agencies. What change in heart rate? What change in blood pressure? What change in contractility? What change in lucidity translates to the disease and you won't get an answer? Ask them about QTC and you get an answer. So I'm going to leave you with this issue. Therefore, how do we know with what precision a measurement should be made, or even if it should be made at all, if we don't have answers to all those questions?
Well, I've enjoyed making this quick presentation to you. Now uh, I hope there will be some questions and answers. We'd love to try to, uh, to uh, see if we can uh, satisfy that requirement. Thanks, Dr. Hammond. I'm back online now. So I've sent a message just to all of our audience now that I'm online. Uh, I can share with everyone. We're obviously at our one-hour point, but we're going to continue with a short Q&A. So for those that can stay on, please do. We've got a couple questions, and we'll share that with both Brian Brockway and Dr. Hamlin now. Um, I'm going to uh, just take over controls, Dr. Hamlin, so bear with me a second. And um, so, yeah, first question. Um, Kind of going back to the middle of the presentation where we also took the audience polling, uh, we had a question, basically paraphrases, what is the most Im important physiological measurement in your opinion that needs to be added uh, to safety testing beyond QTC? So, you know, very fitting to your, your, what your finishing point there. If you were to take one, what, you know, what would that be? Since the reason we have hearts is to move blood, I believe the most important parameter would be cardiac output. Now remember, just because a cardiac output is good doesn't mean the situation is good because it may be very expensive for you to produce that cardiac output. Uh, so, uh, but cardiac output is enormously important. Okay, thank you. Um, and then for uh, Brian, uh, we've got uh, basically a couple questions came in and I'm going to do my best to group them together. So um, the question basically is, uh, with the various implants and the technologies that you know are available on the market, uh, what type of you know caveats or concerns would a scientist need to consider uh, in planning an exercise and uh, metabolic function uh, application? Uh, so I think the question is trying to get at uh, also what you mentioned about um, uh, animals freely moving, being very active, uh, not just conscious. So, Hi, Brian. Do we have you now? Yeah, I'm, I'm back. Yeah, I'm not sure what happened. Okay, uh, not to worry. So um, did you hear the, qu why don't I repeat the question? Basically, we've had a couple of questions come in from the group, and, and to sum it up, people would like to hear your, um, you know, thoughts on the things that scientists need to consider when they're looking at um, uh, implant applications, collecting physiological measurements in things like an exercise application where animals aren't just conscious, but you know they're you know they're maybe being uh, maybe they're running a treadmill uh, uh, protocol. So uh -huh. you know I, I think this is maybe also speaking to the way the questions have come in is you know what technical advancements might be available or coming soon that you know about um, that will improve the ability to collect these signals without um, you know interruption noise and you know other things that uh, kind of take away from accurate signals yeah I mean th this is something that that uh, that Bob may want to comment on because uh, there's a lot of physiology involved with that as well but you know if uh, oxygen consumption obviously can uh, can provide some indication of, of metabolism I know Bob Bob what are your thoughts on on the types of measurements that you would uh, like to see along those lines well I Again, I'm, I'm uh, uh, obsessed, but I think for a good reason, with energetics. I mean, anything you can do to provide information on the balance between oxygen delivery and oxygen demand is critical. Again, because we know that uh, uh, people who get uh, heart, uh, heart transplants uh, uh, are commonly people who have been given antineoplastics uh, when they're kids, and maybe two decades later, or at least one decade later, they start getting into trouble. And that's because of energetic imbalance, principally. Uh, the other issue that, that people forget, and I'm sure glad you brought this up, is leucotropy, ease of filling. Uh, it, sh it might surprise people to know that morbidity and mortality from heart failure stems 50% from, from inability to generate a forceful contraction and 50% from inability to fill properly. So it's not fair to not look at both inotropy and leucotropy, and those, those uh, uh, parameters can be inferred from high fidelity ventricular pressure curves, and of course uh, we now have those available from data science, and uh, they're ex extremely important to predict those parameters which translate to morbidity and mortality. Very good.
I think um, what we'll try to do as well is uh, I'll share the specific questions that came in from our audience and if there are some technical considerations as well regarding housing type of implants, you know, limitations there, or maybe, again, what is new in the market that will enable scientists to maybe tackle these exercise physiology and metabolic applications where they might be challenging the subject uh, a little bit more intensely as part of the protocol. Maybe we can address that in the follow-up materials as well. Um, another question, uh, perhaps it will, our last one here, uh, in the interest of time, going back to um, the new sensors that you mentioned, Brian, uh, mm -hmm. specifically relating to ChemFETs, uh, we've got a question uh, whether this would relate to clinical chemistry. So examples would be liver enzymes, um, uh, creatinine levels, th things of this nature. Is it a possibility that these quote unquote chemfets will be uh, you know applicable to this type of uh, science I, you know I I'm not an, an expert in chemfets but uh, my understanding is that with chemfets and some of the other new sensor technology that has uh, come along in the last few years that you can virtually design those to measure just about any type of chemical entity or molecule in the blood um, and, and then it's a matter of keeping the sensor patent so that you can uh, take those measurements over a period of time without interference from fibrotic tissue growth. So, um, yeah, I, I, I would say that, that there will be a day that if, there, if there's enough need for something like that, that um, those sensors will be, become available. Excellent. It's re it, it does really sound like an exciting area um, uh, to have, you know, so much enabled in the scientist's hands as far as the type of measurements they can make and the data they can collect from the bloodstream in the human body as far as concentrations, etc. So um, perhaps we can look into that as a, a future dedicated topic uh, is what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah, well, yeah, in the interest of time, gentlemen, I, I'd like to thank both of you for your contribution to this opening event. Um, I hope our, uh, all of our audience out there in the interweb has enjoyed this uh, first session of Biotelemetry for the Life Sciences. Uh, thank you for joining us, those in the audience, and as always, the full recording of today's lecture, the slide deck, and any supplementary materials will be available on InsideScientific.com. Uh, links to these resources will be provided to all registrants, as always, and will be accessible uh, for free uh, on the web. So um, I'd like to officially close things off now. Again, welcome the audience to send in a few more questions. If something's lingering now, our, the, the program will run for a few minutes um, as we all uh, sign off. And uh, following, we also welcome questions or comments. Please complete our survey and feel free to email us at events at insightscientific.com. So again, um, uh, Brian, thank you very much for your contribution today. Dr. Hamlin as well, great to have you again. And hopefully we'll have you for another event in the near future. Yeah, thanks very much, Andy. My pleasure. You did a good job. All right, <laughs> you both as well. Excellent. Have a wonderful day, everybody, and we'll see you again soon.